This program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. Hey, I want to welcome those who are watching online, those who are watching uh, by television, those who are at Mill Creek at our campus there, at our campus here. As of July the 21st, 2019, just happened, according to the Guinness World Book of Records, the most anticipated movie of all time had the biggest domestic opening weekend in history. First weekend it came out, made $350 million dollars. Fastest movie in history to gross $1 billion. It took only five days for that movie to make a billion. As a matter of fact, it grossed $2.79 billion in five days, making it the highest grossing movie of all time. What was it that was so exciting? What was it that people, why would people want to see this movie so badly? And by the way, I was one of them. Well, it was the title. That made it so anticipated. If you are an Avengers fan, and I am an Avengers fan, uh, the title kept you in suspense because the title of the movie was Avengers Endgame. How many of you saw that movie? Raise your hands up. Okay, if you hadn't seen it, y'all see it. Avengers Endgame. And what got me so intrigued and the reason why I wanted to see it was not the first word, it was the last word, Endgame. Because if you know what that word means, it, it, uh, it, it's the ultimate agenda. It's the desired consequence of a planned series of events. So if you're like me and you're a big Avengers fan, you knew, okay, there's going to be some things happening in this movie that I don't expect are going to happen. There probably will be some characters that will come to an end that I did not expect to come to an end. And the, noise gonna, the, the narrative is going to have an end result in mind. And I just could not wait to see what it was. Lived up to my expectations. But I remember walking out of the movie thinking to myself, what a great title. Because since the beginning of time, God has had an end game for every single person who has ever lived. As a matter of fact, for those of you who find this book hard to understand and maybe you haven't read a whole lot of it, you really could summarize the entire story of 66 books in the Bible by that single word, end game. Because the reason why the Bible was written was to tell all of us what God's end game is for us and what God wants for us at the very end. We're in a series, if you're a guest of ours today in the book of Ephesians, we've entitled Unbelievable. Because I don't believe there's any other book in the Bible that tells us what an unbelievable God that we worship, that tells us about the unbelievable things that God has done for us and the unbelievable plans that God has for us who love him. There's so many things God wants to do in us and through us. And we're in a passage today in Ephesians. And by the way, if you're in the habit, I hope you are, bringing your little discipleship book, uh, we're on page 24. So this passage is right there in your book. We're in Ephesians 2. Let me just kind of set up what's going on in this letter that Paul wrote to a church 2,000 years ago. There, is, uh, there was a group of people called Ephesians, obviously lived in Ephesus, who were brand new believers. And for those of you who know anything about church, you grew up in church, there are actually two verses in the book of Ephesians that most everybody knows. Some of you have memorized, and you've heard it more than once. It may be next to John 3, 16, two of the most famous verses in the Bible, and they go like this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is one of those passages when I was a boy, when I got saved as a nine-year-old boy, this was one of the passages that my Sunday school teacher encouraged me to memorize. And, 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 and here's, here's what's so interesting about this verse. Many of us know that verse. We've heard that verse. We say, oh yeah, that's kind of what we teach and preach every Sunday. And in a way it is. But the problem is many of us, most of us don't know what comes before it. And we don't come, know what comes after it. And yet you can't really appreciate the truth of the gospel. You can't really understand the story of the Bible. You really can't understand who you are, who you can be, and who God wants you to become until you see the full story before the end game. 
And the passage we're going to look at today in Ephesians 2, it's one of those passages that it has it all. It talks about our past, everybody's past. It talks about our present, what should be and hopefully is your present. And it talks about what could be and what should be our future. Because when you read your story in the Bible, and we're all in the Bible, it's really about past guilt, present grace, and future glory. <clears throat> so in the spirit of Avengers Endgame, I want you to pretend today that we're going to show you a movie. And you're in the movie. Now, you're not the star of the movie. There are three stars in the movie. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're the stars. But we are the supporting cast. And even though the movie is really all about them, it really is for us. And I'm going to do you a big favor. Those of you who say, I'll tell you, I know I ought to read the Bible. I know I should study the Bible. It's so big. It's so long. It's so deep. It's so hard to understand. I want to show you today that in one passage of the Bible, just one, just 10 verses, you're going to see the whole story of the Bible. You're going to have a 30,000 foot view because you can basically break down the story of the Bible into three parts. And once you see those three parts, you're going to finally understand when you walk out of these doors today, okay, so that's what history is all about. And that's what the world is all about. That's what culture is all about. <clears throat> that's what life is all about. This is what I am all about. And if you'll get these three things down in your heart and your mind and understand them and believe them and live them, not only will everything going on in the world begin to make really good sense to you, no matter, no, 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 what am I trying to say? <laughs> no matter what your worldview may be, you'll understand why I believe the only worldview that makes sense is the Christian worldview. So there are three things that Paul says, and the first one you're not going to like. It's going to shock your system. If you're into political correctness, you're not going to like it, but I want you just to stay with me. Part one of the story is this. People are hopelessly lost. People are hopelessly lost. Now, again, just to kind of give you some backdrop. If you met Paul today, you would say, I don't know what kind of guy Paul was, but I can tell you one thing. He was pretty plain spoken. He wasn't in political correctness. He really didn't always have the best bedside manner. And he proves it right here because he gets right to the point he doesn't mince words. He doesn't pull punches. He said, I want to describe for you every single person that's ever been born, what we were all like the moment we came out of our mother's womb. And he's talking about people who are without Jesus. So if you do not know Christ today, or you know someone that does not know Christ today, this is all about those people. And his first statement is dogmatically and, and, and devastatingly just direct. Now listen to what he says. He says, as for you, that's us, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So here's what he says. The second you came out of your mother's womb and you drew your first breath, you were born spiritually dead. We were all born D-O-A. We were dead on arrival. Oh, yeah, we were alive physically, but we were dead spiritually. In other words, when we were born, it's not that we were on God's wavelength and somehow we lost the station. Paul said, no, the problem was your antenna was completely down and you don't even have a signal. You, you don't even, you, you, when it comes to God, you really don't know much of anything. And he says it so starkly. He says, look, we're not spiritually deficient. We're not spiritually debilitated. We're not spiritually disabled. We're not spiritually deprived. He said, we are spiritually dead. Now you say, okay, I don't understand that. Well, we somehow know this intuitively, even though the Bible also teaches it. And that is, we're more than just a body. We're a spirit. We have a soul. And we may be visibly alive on the outside, but we are virtually dead on the inside. And you see that when you understand that, then you go all the way back to the first story in the Bible, the book of Genesis, and you say, okay, it makes sense. I understand why we are that way. So if you don't know the story, let me refresh your memory. God puts Adam and Eve in a garden called Eden. It was an absolutely perfect environment. God has kind of given them Garden of Eden 101, kind of an orientation session. He points to all this beautiful garden. He said, hey, this is yours. Enjoy it. Have at it. It's your, I want you to live here forever. However, he says, there's one 
caveat. There's a little fine print in the contract, and here it is. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when, and that literally says in the moment, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So they were forewarned to be forearmed to be forearmed. So they're warned. Don't do it. You'll die. It'll kill you. <clears throat> then you read the story, and it's interesting. Eve eats the fruit. She doesn't drop dead. Adam eats the fruit. He didn't drop dead. God doesn't lie. God said, not later, not sometime in the future. He said, at the exact moment you eat of that fruit, you will die. Well, they did die. Not on the outside, they died on the inside. They didn't die physically, they died spiritually. And here's what happened. In their spirit, the light went out and they were in spiritual darkness. In their spirit, the life left and they're in spiritual deadness. And ever since that time, every person who's ever been born except Jesus who came into this world are a part of the walking dead. Have you ever seen The Walking Dead, one of the most popular TV shows in recent years? That's what people are without Christ. They're spiritual zombies. They're alive on the outside. They are dead on the inside. And until Jesus comes in and gives life, they're in the dark. Uh, they're in death. Until Jesus gives light, they're in the dark. That's why apart from the power of God, People can look at the Bible. They can read the Bible, but they can't see it's true. People can listen to the gospel. They can't hear it's true. People, somebody said, people without God are hopelessly lost. They're like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that's not there. They're lost. I'll give you a great example. We're going to talk about having your one in just a moment. A beautiful couple. I've been their pastor over 30 years. They brought a, 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 a young man up to me, visit our church at our 9 o'clock, at our 915 service. He's from India. His initials are AC. I want you to pray for AC. Just pray. He, God knows who he is. This man has no spiritual background whatsoever. None. Zero. He came and heard what I'm telling you right now. Stayed for the whole message. I, I was talking to him, sharing with him, gave, gave him some material. He heard me preach this message. I, and you, I hope you're going to say, I can't make what I'm going to say today any plainer than I'm going to make it today. I may as well have been talking to a wall. Confused didn't get it, didn't phase him, didn't move, the, didn't move the ball one yard. Why? Spiritually dead. Without the power of God, he can't see the truth, he can't hear the truth, he cannot know the truth. Hopelessly lost. Now, once we understand that, once we understand that and say, okay, I get that, once we do, then we'll see how everything else that Paul says just naturally flows because he goes on to say this. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now watch this, in which you used to live. How did you live? When you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now Paul says, look, I, you're not gonna like this. You're gonna say, some of you gonna think, are you, can you really believe this stuff? Yeah, he does, and I do. He said, everybody in this world follows God and his ways or they follow Satan and his ways. Everybody serves one God or the other. And here's the difference. God is the God of the living. Satan is the God of the dead. If you're spiritual, spiritually alive, you're going to worship the God of the living. If you're spiritually dead, you're going to serve the God of the dead. God leads us to obey him. Satan leads us to disobey him. So we're all born, Paul says, with this spirit of disobedience. And I said this to you, I think, last week. At least if you're a parent of a child, you get it. You know, you, you understand it. I mean... There's never been a parent, to my knowledge, if you let me know if you know of one, there's never been a parent in history that sat down with their child and say, let me teach you how to disobey me. Matter of fact, I got to think about this the other day. I've, I've never had this happen. I don't think ever, I've never talked to a pastor that has. I, as you can imagine, I've counseled a lot of parents, right, that come in, they're broken, they're weeping, they're, they're, they're tearing their hair out. They've got an incorrigible child. They've got a rebellious kid. They've got a kid they can't control, a kid that just gives them just literal hell at home. And they'll come in and see me. I have never in all of my years of counseling, I, never, I've never had parents come in and sit down and say, Pastor, I've got a problem with my child. Can you help me? Yeah, what's the problem? Well, all he wants to do is obey us. I've never had anybody come say that to me. Can, can you help me get my kid to disobey me? I've never had that happen. It's always just the opposite. Why? 
Because you don't have to teach a child to lie or steal or to get angry or to be mad or to fight or to cheat. You don't have to do that. They learn on their own. Why? Paul says they're born with a spirit of disobedience. The news continues. All of us, every one of us, we've lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, i.e. doing whatever we want to do. If it feels good, we do it. Following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now, Paul specifically wants these Ephesians to know, I'm talking to all of you. Why did he say that? Because in that audience, there were not just Gentiles, there were Jews. And there was these Jews who said, wait a minute, you you can't be talking about me. I'm a child of Abraham. I grew up learning that I had to obey God. I had to keep the commandments. I went to the synagogue. I went to the temple. I gave my tithes. You can't be talking to me. Paul says, no, I'm talking to all of you. I don't care whether you're a Jew or Gentile. I don't care if you're a capitalist or a socialist. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. I'm not just talking to murderers and terrorists and rapists or child abusers. I'm talking to you if you're straight. I'm talking to you if you're gay. If you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you're born in royalty or born in poverty, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about the best of us. I'm talking about the worst of us. We're all like that little boy who got into a fight with his sister, and she she really hurt his sister. And, And they got into this big fight, and he kicked her in the shins, and then he pulled her hair. Well, her mother came running the room, found out what happened. He was the bigger brother, and she pulled him aside. She said, Sam, I want to ask you a question. Why did you let the devil make you kick her in the shins and pull her hair? That honest little boy said, Mom, let's get something straight. The devil made me kick her in the shins. Pulling her hair was my idea. (laughs) Now, that is exactly the way we are. Sin is our idea. Nobody has to teach us to do that. And that's why this is so important. Listen to me. We will never understand who Jesus was. We'll never understand what Jesus did. And we'll never understand why Jesus had to be who he was and why he had to do what he did until we first understand who we are and what we have done. And Paul was talking to people who believe in Jesus and those who do not believe in Jesus. And here's what he was saying. So I'm gonna boil down what Paul said now in in this sentence and then you'll go, okay, I get it. One of two things is true about every one of you listening to me right now. Absolutely true. Either you were spiritually dead or you are spiritually dead. It's true of every one of you in this room. Everyone listen to me right now. Either you were spiritually dead or you are spiritually dead. And these verses are either talking about your past or they're talking about your present. Now, here's what's, here's what's really helpful. When you finally get this in your mind and you understand what Paul said, now something begins to make a lot of sense. Because there's one thing nobody nobody will deny. Whether you believe in God or not, whether you got a Christian world over you or not, there's one thing none of us will deny. Evil is in this world, and there's a lot of it. We see it every day. Babies are killed. Children are abused. People are murdered. Wars are fought. Bombers commit suicide and homicide. In fact, somebody put it best when they said it this way. Listen to this. They said, I will never understand those who can read the headlines every day and then assert that people are basically good. I will never understand those who believe that spiritual problems can be solved with social programs, that peace can be achieved by treaties, that prejudices can be eliminated by discussion, that rebellious youth can be corrected with heavy doses of esteem and understanding, that scars can be healed through therapy, that wrongs can be righted by litigation, and that diseases can be eliminated by research. Evil is woven into the very fabric of humanity, and it is obvious. He is exactly right. It is why the world is in the mess that it's in, because people are hopelessly lost. But that's not the end game. It does get better, a lot better. Because Paul says, look, the bad news is people are hopelessly lost. The good news is God is graciously love. God, can I get an amen to that? God is graciously love. Now, think about this. In all my ministry, I've come to realize there are two, there are two conditions of the human spirit that are just killers. I mean, they're just crushing. They're just devastating. They're, they're, when people come to me and they're in one or both of these conditions, I cannot tell you how, 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 how hard it is to deal with them. One 
is when you feel absolutely helpless. It's like the parent, and you have a child. And the doctor says, we've got to operate on your child. We've got to operate right now. If we don't operate, your child's going to die. But I must tell you, if we operate, your child may still die. Your child may not make it through the operation, but we don't have a choice. And at that moment, you feel absolutely helpless. You want to take the place of that child, but you can't. All you can do is wait and pray. That's all you can do. We've all been there. Helpless. But there's a good a condition that's even worse than that. And some of you may be in this room and you say, this is where I am right now. It's not that you feel helpless. You feel hopeless. You convince yourself, there's just no light at the end of my tunnel. I, I've got a problem that nobody can solve. I've got a question that nobody can answer. I feel absolutely hopeless. And what Paul has described is the human race apart from God. Because I've got some news for you. You better get it right. If you don't know God, you are helpless. If you don't know Jesus, you are hopeless. There is no help for you. There is no hope for you. We are hopelessly and helplessly lost. Now, I don't want to beat that drum too much because I want to get to the good news. Paul then adds two simple words. But they are awesome words. And they take us from the valley of despair to the mountaintop of delight. They are two words that absolutely guarantee if you feel helpless today, there's help for you. If you feel hopeless today, I'm telling you, there is hope for you. You say, what in the world? What two words are they? Watch this. Two words. But God. But God. I mean, take that first word, but. Have you ever thought about the difference that little three-letter word can make in your life? The telephone rings, 2 o'clock in the morning. It's your son or your daughter. Dad, Mom. I have been in a terrible wreck, and your heart leaps in your throat. But then you hear them say, but everybody's okay. Changes everything. You get a call 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's your doctor. You have cancer. Your breath is taken away until he says, but it's completely curable, and we've caught it in time. Changes everything. I got a picture, um, I was at, did a funeral Friday, and one of my, I, was, I used to be back in, in my younger days, I was a student pastor, a youth minister, and one of the girls in my student ministry had taken a picture of me and Teresa when we first met, the first day we met at Tripp McConnell College, smoking hot, still smoking hot, boy, she was smoking hot, and, and what's so sweet is she's looking at me like I'm smoking hot, that's what I love about the picture. I kind of had the Burt Reynolds thing going. That's a whole other story. But anyway, so, 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 they, so they sent me this picture, okay? So she says to me, and she accepts my proposal for marriage, you know, I could marry any guy I want to, but I choose you. Changed everything. <laughs> Changed everything, right? Changed everything. Or, or how about this one? A wife is talking to her best friend. She says, you know what? She said, what? She said, my husband's lost his mind. And the neighbor starts to console her until the wife says, but it wasn't a big loss. I mean, that word, but, it just kind of changes everything, right? It eases the pain. But then you take that word, but, watch this, and you put it with the word God. Now, those two words don't just make a big difference. They make all the difference. They make an eternal difference. I don't know if you guys are fired up about what I'm doing. I'm just fired up about this. Listen. Paul doesn't say, you know, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but you. He didn't say, but you. You know why? Because you can't do anything. You are dead. I can't do anything for you. You're dead. We can't do anything for each other. We are dead. But God, that God that spoke a world into existence, that God who raised his son from the dead, that God who has said with his own lips, there is nothing too difficult for me. But God said, you know what? I can do the impossible. I can bring life to your dead soul. I can bring light to your dark soul. 
I can bring hearing to the spiritually deaf. I can give life to the spiritually dead. I can, can give sight to the spiritually blind. Well, what did God do? How did God pull that off? Well, in verse five, Paul gives us three words that just ought to, I mean, that'll just make you want to shout. Listen to what he says. Here's what God did. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. That word made us alive is only used twice in the New Testament. It's a compound word that literally means to make life. And here's what Paul is saying. We were dead before God came to us. But God has a specialty. God has a hobby. He loves to take what's dead and bring it to life. Amen. He did it from the very beginning of time. He took dust. The Bible says dust, dirt, and breathed into it. And man became a living soul. And that's what God loves to do. He makes a man alive physically in Genesis, and then for the rest of history, he makes us alive spiritually. But, big question, why did God do that? Why, why did God make us alive? Nobody made him do it. Nobody coerced him to do it. Nobody paid him to do it. There was no law that said he had to do it. Why does God do that for us? Well, this is where this all gets richer and better and sweeter. Okay, so we're going to put these two verses together. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Now, I highlighted three words there because they make such an eternal difference in our lives. Love, mercy, and grace. So here's the story. You ready? People are hopelessly lost, but God is graciously loved. And remember, God loved us when we were dead. God loved us when we were disobedient. God loved us when we were depraved. You know, some, say, you know, some people say love is blind. Well, God's love isn't blind. God looked at us with all of our faults and all of our failures and all of our flaws, and he said, you know what? I still love you. And I will still send Jesus to die for you. And even if you reject me, I am going to love you. God loved us when we were unloving. God loved us when we were unlovable. I've told you this so many times. Listen to me. God does not love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because God loves us. God loves us, but it gets better. God is also rich in mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is when you don't give what somebody deserves. And I'm so glad today that the well of God's mercy never runs dry and the reach of God's mercy never falls short and the light of God's mercy never goes out. And then the bow on the top of God's gift of love and mercy is the ribbon of grace. He said, it is by grace that you have been saved. In other words, Paul said, it all starts with grace. It all ends with grace. So because of God's mercy, guess what? I don't get what I, what I deserve. Because of God's grace, guess what? I get what I don't deserve. And because of God's love, I get grace and I get mercy. Now that raises a question. Why grace? And as I've studied the Bible, I can only give you this one answer. There's no reason for grace except grace. There's just no reason for grace except grace. And the only reason there's even one Christian on this planet is because of the love of God who gives us grace. He is the God of gracious love. Amen. But that's still in the end game. That's not the end result. That's not the end of the story. It gets better than that. Y'all, people are hopelessly lost. God is graciously loved. But how does this end game become possible? Who, who pulls it off? Well, this, this, I saved the best for last. Jesus is universally Lord. He is universally Lord. Now, Paul uses a phrase four times in this passage. Don't you, you'll hear it. Listen to it. For he made us alive with Christ. And God raised us up with Christ. He expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. We are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus. In other words, you know what Paul's saying? It all begins with Jesus. It all ends with Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. And you know what? That's the way it has to be. Let me tell you why. 
Only the Lord can give spiritual life. The pastor can't do it. The priest can't do it. The Pope can't do it. Only the Lord can give spiritual life. And Jesus Christ is Lord. And because he is universally Lord, that means he's Lord over everything and he's Lord over everyone. That means he is Lord over life and death. And if he's Lord over life and death, well then guess what? He's the only one that can give life to death. Why? Because he's the only one who rose from the dead. When I was talking to that man out there after the nine o'clock service, the man I told you about a while ago, I gave him a book, I gave him some material and I said, I, I, I said AC, that's his initials, I said, AC, I said, I want you to think about one thing until we see each other again. I said, just one thing. I gave my email address. I said, after you read these materials, I want to come talk to you. But I just want you to think about one thing. I said, no matter what else you believe about Jesus, it all comes down to one thing. Either he was raised from the dead or he wasn't. It's just, it's not hard to figure out. Either he was or he wasn't. I said, now look, if he wasn't, if he's just like everybody else, he's just like the Buddha, he's just like Confucius, he's just like Mohammed, he's still dead, he's still in the grave. I don't care what you believe, it doesn't matter to me. I said, but if he came back from the grave, that changes everything. Amen. And I said, the fact that he came back from the grave tells me that's why we can live. So here's what Paul says. God made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Now, let me tell you what this means. Because Jesus lives physically, I can live spiritually in him. Because Jesus lives physically, I can live personally for him. Because Jesus lives physically, I can live eternally with him. But it's only with Jesus and it's only in him. Jesus. So I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Now, the 915 crown didn't do real well with this. Now, you've got to be better. Because this is going to sound like a trick question. It's not. And I want you to say this real loud, okay? All right, you ready? Because I've, I've, I've prepped you. Now, you've got to get this. You've got to get this. The only thing a dead person needs is what? Life. Say it out loud. Life. They need life. A dead person needs life. They don't need money, they can't spend it. They don't need food, they can't eat it. They don't need water, they can't drink it. They don't need air, they can't breathe it. They don't need light, they can't see it. They don't need music, they can't hear it. A dead person needs one thing, life. I need life. And Paul says, though we were dead in trespasses and sin, we can be alive for one reason. You know why I can be alive? Because he's alive. I can be alive because he's alive. See, he lives, and because he lives, so can I and so can you. That's where a lot of churches don't get it. A lot of you don't get it. Christianity is not about making sick people feel better. It's not about making sad people more happy. It's not even about helping bad people get good. Christianity is about giving dead people life because that's exactly what they need. And see, that, is the end game. However, this is where we still miss it. The end game for us in God's mind is not just giving us eternal life. God didn't just bring Jesus so we could all go to heaven and sing Kumbaya and drink Kool-Aid and watch Georgia play football. That is not why God, God sent Jesus. Oh yeah, you say, but, but, but we're going to live in peace one day. Yes, we are, but that's not the end game. The end game means what are we going to do right here and right now with what Jesus has done for us? So Paul says this, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to go to heaven, not just that, to live happily ever after, not just that, to have eternal life, not just that, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, why did God save us? God saves us to serve him. I told you the other day, our salvation is not primarily for our good. It is for his glory. And true salvation doesn't just lead to heaven, and it's more than just happiness. It leads to holiness. Now, to be sure, let me make sure you hear this. The end game is absolutely done. It is absolutely guaranteed. Yes, one day we are going to be happy in heaven. But in the meantime, God says, oh, but today be holy. Today, model that holiness here on this planet. How do you do that? Do good for other people. Give your life to doing good works. Do your life to serving the needs of others. Doing your life to doing good works. So when you came in today, every one of you should have got this card. I want everybody to pull this card out right here. Everybody got this card? You should have one. If you don't, we'll give one on the way out. This little card said, 
Who's your one? Now, if some of you never heard this card, I'm going to talk to you. Some of you have heard this card, never done anything with it. I'm going to talk to you, okay? If you believe everything I've just said, and you would even say, I don't only believe it, I've experienced it. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But God made me alive through Christ, and I have eternal life, and I've been forgiven of my sins, and I'm right with God. You, of all people, should have that card filled out right now if you don't want to have it. You should have it filled out right now. Who, who is your one? Now, if you've already filled this card out, I want you just to sign it and fill it out again with that name. You say, yeah, I've, I've got my one. I've been praying for that one. All right, write that name down. But if this is new to you, I'm going to ask you to do something right this moment. You're a believer. You say you're a believer. God did not give you eternal life so you could stick it in your back pocket and keep it to yourself. Jesus said, nobody, nobody lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. No, you're to share it. So I'm going to ask many of you right now, you, you may be out of, I don't even know why, out of stubbornness, out of fear, I don't know what it is. I'm going to ask you to write down the name of one person that you know that is spiritually dead. And they need life. They don't need church. They don't need religion. They need life. And I'm going to ask you to write down that name right now. Do it right now. I'm going to ask you to write down that name and just say, I'm asking God to give me the opportunity to share my faith in Jesus with them by December of this year. Now, on this card, you'll see a website. You can go get more information, more training materials for sharing the gospel. We've got a display out in the lobby today where you can pick up a printed copy of the training. You can invite, use these invite cards. We've got all kinds of tools for you to do that. So let me just kind of wrap this up. Mount Whitney is a place I'd like to see someday because it is in California, it's the high, I don't want to go because it's California, but it is the highest spot in the continental United States, 14,495 feet. Now, if you hike to the top of Mount Whitney, you'll be surrounded by crystal clear air, cool breezes, beautiful lakes, great scenery. But if you're on the top of Mount Whitney and you look 80 miles to the southeast, you'll be looking at Death Valley. You'll be looking at, from the highest point in the continental USA, you'll be looking at the lowest point in the continental USA and the hottest place in the country where it can get to up to 134 degrees in the shade. Now, I'll tell you that story for this reason. What I've just shared with you today and what Paul just wrote for us in this book is the spiritual biography of every one of us. Because of Jesus, today, some of you could go from the valley of spiritual death to the mountaintop of eternal life. But for those of us who would say, oh, pastor, I've already done that. I, I'm, I'm climbing that mountain right now. I'm on the road. God is expecting you to try to take other people with you. Jesus said, when you come to the valley of the shadow of death, you won't be by yourself. I'll be with you. But in the meantime, while you're in the mountains of life, you bring other people with you. You do those good works. Take other people. So I love true stories, and I'll close you with this. There were some fishermen. This true story happened about 100 years ago. They were in a, in a, they were in a, in a dining room in a Scottish inn by the sea, and they were talking, giving, telling fish stories. And so this, they're all talking about the biggest fish they got that, you know, that they lost. And there was one man talking about this big fish that got away. And he, and he was spreading his arms out to show just how big the fish was that got away. And as he spread his arms out, a maid was walking by with a pitcher of tea. And he kind of hit that teapot and it flew into this beautiful white wall and it broke into pieces. And it just stained the whole wall with this, with this brown tea. Well, the innkeeper came running out to see what happened. He looked at that wall and he said, oh my goodness. He said, this whole wall will have to be repainted. Well, a stranger was sitting over at a table and he stood up and he said, sir, maybe you don't have to repaint that wall. He said, what do you mean? He said, uh, well, would you mind if I did a little work on it? And the innkeeper said, well, I got nothing to lose, sure. So the man reached under the table, pulled out a suitcase, opened it up and he pulled out pencils and brushes and jars of oil and pigment and paint. And he walked over to that wall where all that tea stain was and he began to paint lines, or, uh, you know, stretch these, sketch these lines around the stains. He began to apply a different shade over here and a different color over there and all these splashes of tea, you know, were there. 
And to their amazement, this image began to emerge out of this brown tea. And when it was finished, on that wall was this beautiful deer with a big rack of antlers. The man signed the wall at the bottom, paid for his meal, and his left, and he left. His name was Sir Edwin Landseer, very famous painter of wildlife. And in his hands, what was a terrible, tragic mistake had become a beautiful, tremendous masterpiece. And I read that story, and I thought about my own spiritual biography. I came into this world, I was covered from head to toe with a stain of sin. I was spiritually dead. But because of Jesus, God can take even the worst of us, and God can make a masterpiece out of us that one day will go into the trophy of his grace, the trophy case of his grace, and it will be the end game of all end games. So this is not just my cry to you. This is my plea to you. I'm not naive. I've been doing this a long time. There are people in this room right now, and you've maybe wondered sometime, why, why, why don't I change like these other people? Why don't I have what these other people have? I'll tell you why. You're spiritually dead. My words won't bring you to life. They won't. But God's truth can bring you to life. And the truth is, what God did for me and what God's done for so many, God can do for you. He can and He will make you alive through Christ if you will just trust Him. I have a question for you, and it's a tough one. Are you more concerned with your outward image than with your inner qualities? Most everybody struggles with this question, myself included, because we've been told image is everything. And this got me to thinking and eventually led me to write a book on the subject of character. You see, your reputation is what others think is true about you, but your character is who you really are on the inside. When it's all said and done, it's your character that counts. I want to invite you to order your copy of my new book, Character Still Counts Today, and begin to invest your life into what matters most, your character. Go to touchinglives.org to order your copy of Character Still Counts Today, and remember this, when you die, your reputation will be gone forever, but character will stick with you for all eternity. Touching the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.